Right, it is the final day of the Premier League on Sunday and loads of great storylines to get stuck into. Delighted to say that David Myler is with us. David, how are you getting on? Good morning, Owen. How are you? Very well, thanks. Uh, let's look back on Wednesday night. First of all, Jordan Henderson lifting the Premier League trophy. Not a bad feeling, I'd say, to see your buddy lift it, do the Hendo shuffle and uh, send Liverpool <laughs> into ecstasy. Yeah, I, like everybody who's like a Liverpool supporter would have been wondering, was he OK? Obviously, he picked up the injury and then... I'd spoken to him um, three or four days out and he said, no, I think I should be okay to do it. And then I asked, are you going full JT with the kit? <laughs> and he said, um, I'm not putting my shin pads on, but I'm putting the, the full lot on. And I said, you have to really, because for such an iconic moment, I said, you don't want to be standing there in your tracksuit lifting the trophy and that. So I said, like, as much as people like to take the mick out of John Terry, I think everybody in the same situation would have done the exact same. So, no, look, watching him lift it... Um, Tremendously proud of him, so happy for him. Um, it's a huge honour. Like to like the twelve months he's had winning, you know, the Champions League, Super Cup, the World Club Cup, and then the Premier League, and to captain them and lift all the trophies is is just phenomenal stuff, really. What, what is the foundation of the resilience that exists in Jordan Henderson's mind to go from a place where that Liverpool team was roundly derided, I think, by a lot of people at, at the end of the Brendan Rodgers tenure, or at least during a, a period in, in that time. Like you're, you're just looking back on the, the Stoke 6-1 game five years ago, last month or the month before, and he's one of the only players still there, I think the only starter who's, who's still involved with the squad from that day. Why is it Jordan Henderson that is the man that made that step up and is the man who's managed to hang around to get to this level? Well... If I go back, if I go back a long time ago when we played together at Sunderland, um, Dwight York was there, and obviously Dwight York is famous for playing for Manchester United, being involved in the you know, treble-winning season in '99, um, a phenomenal player. But he used to always say, "It's easy to get to the top; the hardest thing is staying there." And I think that's like when you speak about Jordan, I think it's testament to his mentality. I know a lot of pe he has a lot of doubters. A lot of people think he's not great. Look, he's a superb footballer. Is he on the level of, of, of a Kevin De Bruyne? No. But is there anyone else in the world on that level who plays midfield? Probably not, no. But when you look at Jordan, it's a testament to his character, the type of person he is, the way he you know, pushes himself. You know, you, you speak about the time with Brendan Rodgers, like when he, it looked like he was going to go to Fulham, but he you know, said, no, I'm not going knuckles down, puts his head down, keeps working hard and just does the basics right and sticks the course and then he wreaks his rewards. You know, you look at two, three, two years previous to when Brendan made him captain, he was nearly gone and then he makes him captain and then to go on, I think Jurgen Klopp has evolved him into an even better player and a better person. I think a lot of it stems from the manager now but it's just, it's remarkable that, you know, it's... It, for anyone that's young trying to, you know, carve out a career in the game, he's the fellow that you should look at that, you know, hard work and desire gets you a lot of the way. Do you think that um, evolution will continue, David, like that? You talk about sort of him as a person, and we've all seen the evidence of that over the last few months and the, the evolution of him. Like, he tends to get you hinted at it there, but that backhanded compliment of, you know, he got the most out of his career kind of a thing, which is... Uh, sort of serves serves a double purpose of saying that he's not great. He's turned thirty recently, and I just wonder about that evolution under Klopp. Like, how how much longer can he be a force in that uh, Liverpool midfield? I think I think time catches up with all of us, but I still feel he has another two three seasons left in him at that level. Um, I certainly do. No, you look at. A Ryan Giggs who evolved his game then you, you look at players like even say someone like Steven Gerrard who's at Liverpool previously he evolved his game um, I certainly think the way he conducts himself off the pitch the lifestyle he lives um, he does give himself the best chance he doesn't drink doesn't go out like he eats healthy even from when I first met him at 18 that's 12 years ago he's still he looks after himself even more now than he did then so I'd certainly think you know, he's many seasons left at Liverpool as captain. Was he nervous uh, when you were talking? Because there was a the, good shots of him before during the game, obviously sat in the stands and like a kind of a nervous smile. And he was obviously getting a bit of ribbon from some of the lads around him about what he was going to do for the trophy lift. And that was he nervous about it, excited about it? No, I think, I think, look, you're excited about it. I imagine he had butterflies that, you know, 
everybody who plays, everybody who's young that plays football wants to win the Premier League. And then you go and you captain your team to win in the Premier League. Um, I think, you know, the excitement takes over. It's kind of like they want, obviously, they're playing Chelsea at the time, a very good team in good form, coming off a huge result against United in the FA Cup. That He was probably desperate for the team to win to kind of keep that high buzz around, you know, the ground. Imagine if they had lost and then were presented the trophy. It wouldn't have been great. Um, no, but it's full of excitement. You're getting to do something that... I think he's one of now 13 people who've lifted the Premier League title. So, you know, he's put his name in the history books in Premier League. And then, of course, being the first Liverpool captain to do it. So the excitement would have been the whole way through. I don't think he'd have been nervous. Is not drinking becoming a, a necessary step if you want to achieve big things in uh, top-tier football, David? I mean, times have obviously changed. There's less people. Like, I mean, people don't do it to the level they, they used to in terms of uh, professional footballers. But it seems that the way recovery has been limited now with so many competitions, the summers are getting more and more packed with summer tours, that actually uh, a little bit of downtime to, to, to go drinking for a while, it's just not possible as a, as a modern footballer. Well, I think if you, if you look back to the early 90s when the Premier League first started... Um, you'd have had a lot of British and Irish players playing. I think the Premier League has evolved. Mm. It's now global. Um, you look at the different cultures. Um, we have a lot of, like, say, Muslim players who do not drink at all. If you look back to Arsene Wenger's time when he brought in the French lads, that I think Arsene Wenger was probably the first to kind of change it with nutritionists, like keeping track of what players you know were eating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it has evolved over time, but. <sighs> The good old Irish in me would say there's nothing wrong with, you know, a few a few drinks on a Saturday night after you win a game. Of course, the times of going out till four or five o'clock in the morning and drinking heavily have gone. Um, you know, you can't you can't afford to if you're playing Saturday, Tuesday, and the level that certainly Jordan and Liverpool are at, you know, the games are all so big that you're expected to win and you're expected to put in a performance that you can't you can't give people an excuse to nail you about. That's the way I'd probably look at it. Um, but I don't see nothing wrong with, you know, a, a drink here and there after to celebrate kind of a good result or a good performance. Um, it's just obviously no one went to stop or, you know, like that really. Um, one of the interesting offshoots of having no fans on the ground, uh, as weird as it makes maybe the celebrations afterwards, you get to hear a lot of stuff that goes on on the page and on the sideline. And I'm sure you may have seen the clip of Frank Lampard and Jurgen Klopp yeah. uh, going at it for a couple of minutes on the sideline at some point or another. And part of me was thinking like, you know, fair play to Frank Lampard. And this is like lesson number one in the Jose Mourinho school of coaching that, you know, you give it, give it a little bit on the sideline and sort of make your opposite number know you're there. But there was definitely a part of me that was thinking that maybe actually Frank Lampard, and he's still young in his managerial career, uh, lost the lost the run of himself a little bit, that he was sort of out of control a bit and uh, was allowing himself to get brought into a situation that wasn't um, keeping his mind on the game or, you know, a great message to necessarily send out to his players. What did you make of it all on, on uh, the Lampard side? Um, I don't, look, I don't mind it. Um, if you remember, BT Sport released a uh, clip of, um, I think it was Mason Greenwood second against Bournemouth. And I think it was Adam Smith had said something to Ramsdale in the goal. And then Ramsdale came out and he was effing and, effing and blind. And this, it's part and parcel of the game. I think, like, you know, you, you touch on Lampard and Klopp. I think uh, Frank was obviously kicking off about a foul that wasn't given and what have you. It, it, it is part and parcel of the game. You can talk about fellas aren't. Certainly managers say aren't, you know, they're probably taking their eye off the ball for a minute or two. But these are, it's such demanding, it's such a demanding job. And there's so much at stake that, you know, he's showing that he cares and he's passionate. Yeah, he kind of like, he felt the Liverpool bench were being over the top. And then, of course, you know, after one of the goals, all the staff run out, which is a bit much like, you know, but it does happen. Um, I do think now that there's no fans there and the noise is, I actually quite... I quite like it, being able to hear, mm. because, look, the amount of sledging that went on, you know, on the pitch was remarkable, you know, when I played. Um, you look at even in rugby games, it's probably the exact same. It's everywhere, you know. It's just, I don't think people expect it to be at the level it's at. Um, I always say you can't understand the, the football banter unless you actually you know you you share a change room with a group of players that it is cutthroat it is ruthless um so i i've no problem with it you know managers give and go um 
Like you, you don't mind them getting involved with other managers and with players, David? Is that no. what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I have. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I should have known. I should have known that was an opening question. Um, but even so, if you if you look back on my incident, there was a few things said in between that was never picked up. Um, he made reference to me. I made reference to him, and then you know, that's just the way. It, I I think that's the way it is. You kind of. It's you. You want to show no weakness. You want to show no like that. I don't care about you. Um, do you know what I mean? I had something years ago. I played against Man City. Um, I clean. I clean. I think I cleaned Gareth Barry out in a tackle, and he got up. And I, I told him. I told him where to go. And then I was thinking of all like this fella's played over. I don't know what is it, five, six hundred times in the Premier League. I thought he could. He could literally say anything anything to me like he's won the Premier League he's won FA Cups he's played for England in a couple of major tournaments but all he said to me was you're ugly <laughs> and I was looking I'm kind of going of all the things you could have said to me that's what you've said to me and I said I'm not really bothered about that um, so that's just your opinion I was like Gareth you Barry. could have you could have, you could you, you could have hit me a bit harder like but yeah. it happens all the time fellas do you know what I mean whenever there's a bad tackle somebody will say something to someone you know it's just was part of the game. Few, few words a bit bit worse than that, or? Oh yeah, I've definitely. Obviously, it's we're early in the morning here, so I, I can't really say too much. But yeah, look, Go for it it. Go for it. no, <laughs> no, no, no. But look, it's part and parcel of it. It happens. It happens in a GA pitch. You imagine, you know, someone who's who's as passionate as Davy Fitz. You don't think he's holding his tongue like, and I imagine he's. Effing and blind and have a cut off, you know, mm. players or John Milan. Yeah, John Milan, another one. Yeah, prime example. But well, I, I'm, yeah. that's the beauty of him, isn't it? Mm. I imagine that like, you would, if you, you know, look at the Gooch. The Gooch probably said nothing to no one ever. But I imagine a lot of fellas who were marking and probably tried to have a cut off him and try to get in his head, but it mm. clearly didn't work. Like, I, I watched some of that again this morning. Steve Bruce was out afterwards and he was saying about uh, he was glad it was you that was involved because you weren't going to be rolling around and you were. he, he said you were restrained enough to not punch him back. It, it looked at the time as if that might have been a fine enough line. You were uh, you were eager to get at him. Oh, I was, yeah. Um, like, obviously when it all happens, then your emotions kick in and, you know... If you if you look back at the video, like I do cock my right hand and it's um Ahmed El Mohammed, he kind of just he just knocks me off balance. No, I'm not gonna say, you know, I would have hit him or whatever, but I'd have probably tried to grip hold of him. Um but I think I think it's testament to my GA background, you know, of playing all the way up to minor before I moved to England, that like I was like, I can't be knocked I can't be dropped to the floor here by an old fella like I said it won't it won't go down, and I said my dad's in the crowd as well. I said like you know, I like I just I, I the things that run through my head at the time were as if I go off the pitch here and I got to meet my dad after, and he the first thing he'd yeah. say regardless. I know we got beaten four one or whatever, but he'd have just gone, "You're gone soft, you boy. I can't believe this dropped you." You know it would have been. But even even if you look at after then, Parge goes away, and you know. Alan Parage was assistant at the time with John Carver. He came all chirpy and like I remember I turned to him and I said, I'll finish you in the tunnel, you little midget. That's what I said to him. Um, <laughs> probably can't repeat what I said to Parage at the time, but yeah. It, it, look, it, it's part and parcel of it. Emotions ri ri run high, like and I'm I'm currently in the process of doing my A license. And um the other day we had a, a fantastic presentation by Paul Ozan, um, who's a tutor and obviously he's the Ireland under 16 manager. And it was his uh, presentation was on sideline behaviour. And then you look back at different moments and different things. Um it was really interesting. Like and do you know, obviously as I as I evolve in my road to management, I'll have to check a few things I do mm. and I'm learning a lot from it. Can I, can I just add, the I watched the the his apology afterwards in inverted commas it felt like the greatest non apology of all time. If I had it wasn't, him. it wasn't an apology, and he never. Yeah. I I I covered Hull v Chelsea in the FA Cup um, last season, and obviously Jay Comfrey asked me about it and whatever, and I said oh, Alan Pardew never apologised. No, I've told the story a few times. I might have even told the lads on off the ball, but I had a phone call the following morning. And it was, hello, David, this is Chief Inspector such and such from um, Hull Police Station. And I said, 
yeah, good one. Like I thought it was one of the lads who me up for a wind up, and I, I hung up, and then the phone rang again, same thing. It was only the club secretary Hull that rang me and said, "No, Dave, this is the police. Do you want to press charges?" Um, and I was like, I was like, no, 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 no. I said, look, it's nothing. Like, do you know what I mean? Um, but I could have, I could have proceeded, you know, to obviously press charges and go after him. But no, I wouldn't say it was a headbutt. Like, but you know, he could have, he could have had the decency to acknowledge that. Like, I didn't roll around, you know, the floor crying. I didn't make a big scene of it. Um, I left it go. Um, he did. His secretary wrote a letter that he signed, but that was like the interview he did, which is a token. It was nothing like, do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, he said he was. But, I, I, try, I was trying to push him away with my head, is what he was saying afterwards. Yeah. Which. Yeah. yeah. Ah, sure. Look, look. Each their own. Um, I've moved on from it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't yeah. really. Like it's six <laughs> years ago. You know what I mean? People, people still talk about it, still bring it up. Even uh, if you watch Match of the Day, there they did. You know, during lockdown, they did one of them top ten bizarre moments, and I think I was voted in at number two. Um, so, but it, 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 the, the thing is, it, it it just was so mad. And like, when you look at the record, of Alan Pardew, we'll, we'll move on from it now. But like, he's got this record of we were we were sort of half joking about it earlier on that like the list of people that he's had Barney's with in the sideline or like this, this list of old men like Pellegrini and uh, Wenger, uh, Martin O'Neill and you. <laughs> but uh, it was, it was, did he, it was did just he, so wild. But. Did he have an argument with Martin? Yes, he did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm not surprised Martin didn't ring me and say put him in the ground. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's interesting when when Lampard talks about giving it all that, giving it, giving it the big one. Like, I think the biggest of the big ones was Alan Pardew dancing in the FA Cup final when they took the lead against Manchester United and then ended up getting beaten. Like, is that, is that something that really winds you up as a player when you see the opposition giving it the big one? Is, is that a thing? Is, is like Lampard's anger and his fury midweek, is that commonplace in football? Yeah, it is, yeah. Like, you, you touched on the dance, like... I remember when punching scored and like you're thinking steady steady yourself because you're playing Manchester United you know they've got some exceptional players on the pitch like that you know I don't know I think punching scored after about 25 30 minutes mm -hmm. like it wasn't as if he scored in the last minute that like you've more or less won it like um you're just asking for it to come back and bite you in the arse like but I think I think like you know, obviously Frank has a pop off Jorgen, and obviously I saw Nathan talking to Mark Lawrence in this morning, and he does have a touch of arrogancy. But I, I suppose any, you look at all the greats, Sir Alex, you know Jose Mourinho, Pep Guardiola, Jurgen Klopp, they all have that touch of arrogance, and I think you do need that. Um, like Frank will certainly have a touch of it from his playing career that he's going to mm. take into managing. I think that's that's the age he has. Um, I played under managers that are super nice. And sometimes it doesn't really work. You need to have that that bit something bit different. Um, I think when when you talk about being giving it the big in, certain lads react differently to it. I would kind of I strive to kind of beat you then, or like you know take on the challenge. Other lads might kind of go, yeah, I'm out of my league here. I can't deal with someone like him. I loved it. Like I, if somebody gave it the big in, I'd be like, yeah, I'm well. I've marked your card now. I'm coming after you. Yeah, it's great. I mean, like, nobody should get too precious about it. Like, I think there's a necessary arrogance that's required. And, like, at the time, I think it's kind of surprising to everybody to hear what Frank Lampard is saying. But it's only surprising because we don't ever get to hear this. Managers aren't mic'd up, and we don't get to hear it when there is a, a full stadium. So that's why this is an outlier, I feel. that I, I, I think this is more commonplace than perhaps we realise on the outside looking in. Um, just just one, one thing I wanted to ask you about, David, before we wrap up is just given the magnitude of Sunday, not necessarily in terms of the Champions League places, but in terms of the relegation battle. It's going to be an unbelievable final day. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on what those dressing rooms, those three dressing rooms in particular, are going to be like for Watford, for Villa and for Bournemouth going into the final day of the season, knowing that your Premier League survival is on the line. Is it nervousness? Is it, is it a worry about your livelihoods? Or, or how, how do those dressing rooms tend to operate on a week like this? Oh, it's 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 tough. It's hard. Um, I had a similar situation with Hull in 2012, where we were playing the last game to get promoted, and we were playing Cardiff, who we were champions. Um, 
like that's if you if you look back, that's a famous day in championship history because I don't know if you know we all the games kick off, but I think it was one of the Watford. Watford were third, we were second, and there was only a point between us. Uh, Watford were playing Leeds, we were playing Cardiff, who were already champions. Watford goalkeeper got injured in the warm up, so I believe they had to get a, a young kid from the stand who had been released during the week to go on the bench. Then the game kicked off or whatever. Al Munya was in goal for Watford. He got injured after about 15 minutes. So they had to bring the kid on who ended up making two mistakes for the goal. For the goal, sorry. Um, so, like, tensions are always running high. And if you look at the Premier League, I think going through the change rooms, I think Watford, I don't know the inside story in Nigel Pearson and what actually happened to why he was sacked. You know, he took over at Christmas and he had done a fantastic job. Um, then he gets sacked. I know they played Man City, which is a very, very difficult game. Like, now they're going into their final game against Arsenal. You're thinking, their manager's been sacked. They've just taken a heavy defeat. Do you know what I mean? They'll be feeling the pressure a lot more than, say, an Aston Villa, who had a huge result against Arsenal. Like, they'll be feeling, you know, they're going to West Ham, that they can get a result. West Ham, I think we're done now. So, Aston Villa will be... in spirit should be high and knowing it's in our hands and then like Bournemouth just like nothing nothing can seem to go right for Bournemouth it's it's almost as if they're they'll be pulling their hair out you know um they're 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 playing Everton away so like that's another tough game and you look around the changing rooms I feared for Villa um I just felt that they didn't they couldn't really keep a clean sheet and they never looked like scoring I know they beat Arsenal one nil or whatever um but You'd have to, on the basis of the last game week performances, you'd have to probably back Aston Villa to stay up. Um, Joe, as well with their fixture playing West Ham, who might have just, you know, feel like we're done. Like let's just get this season over and we can we can focus on next season. The change rooms are going to be. Uh, look, boys are boys are fighting for their careers. They're fighting for mm -hmm. their livelihoods. There's so much involved that people don't see that if a club is relegated, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if a club is relegated, people lose their jobs. That's not like players, that's, you know, staff in the stadiums, people who work on the training grounds, there's so much around it. And then, of course, you know, players probably end up having 50% wage cuts, 40% wage cuts. So there's a lot at stake. Um, and it is it is a, a nervous time and there's a lot of pressure involved. So, you know, it's then it's a case of who can put that aside for 90 minutes and actually put in a performance and get a result for their team. What's the ecstasy like when you actually do survive? I suppose 2014, when you stayed up with Hull City, it wasn't a final day of the season sort of job. I think you did it with a month to spare. But still, I'd imagine the elation is unbelievable. Yeah, I think um, looking back on that season, we had played Fulham away. Uh, we were 2-0 down, came back and drew 2-2. Got um, Obviously got a uh, point, Shane Long scored late on. But like it was... We had felt at that moment, ah, we're, we're at the... We're not at the magic 40 mark, but we're we're high enough that we're we're okay. We've got I think it was, we had six games left, and we felt, you know, we'll get a result along the way, whether it be another draw or or maybe get a win. Um, but we actually went and lost six in a row. We lost our final games. Um, it was only because of the FA Cup run that there was kind of like we still had the buzz. Mm. Um, if we hadn't have gotten that result against Fulham, it might have been totally different. But when you when you stay up it's just knowing that I can go and I can enjoy my summer um, I can go and I can relax um, a lot of our lads would have gone playing internationals but you go on a different form you go you know it's always interesting I always look at this when, when you go and you meet up for the international summer games after whether it be a major tournament or friendlies or competitive fixtures that like you have to get a feel that I could have been at the time relegated with Hull. You look at the Sheffield United boys could have been promoted. You could have had, you know, different lads who are at a different team have just stayed up. That there was such a mixed, mixed feeling of obviously when you went into those games. Do you know, there was times like we've obviously seen a lot of Irish lads being promoted over the last few years. So it was it's always interesting, like and the joy that when you do when you stay up is is incredible because you know then once the fixture list comes you're looking for your Liverpool's your Man United's your Man City's where you when are you playing them rather than I said this before it's no disrespect to the championship but you don't get that excited looking at when you're playing whoever in the championship I won't mention teams in case anyone takes disrespect like but you know there's a different buzz 
you know what I mean? And then you're looking, like you look at Chelsea, they've signed Werner, Zayic, it looks like they're about to sign Havertz. You know, then you're like, oh, I can't wait to, you know, test myself against these fellas. The club are spending 40, 50, 60 million on a player. Like, you know, you, I know there's just a, a larger buzz in the Premier League. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, uh, David, enjoy the final day of the season. Adrian, you got one more there, I think. Just you? very quickly, David. Did, did, yeah. and you're going to think I'm uh, Alan Pardew sent, uh, crazier. <laughs> I'm not. Did your dad? What did your dad say to you afterwards? Um, no. He, um, let me just. All he said was, "Well done," because I didn't throw myself to the floor. Mm. And then he said, and then he just went, "No press." Right. He said, "No Stay press." Away from it. Is the car uh, coming out in him? Yeah, he said, stay away from Owen, Nathan, and all that. That's what he was saying. He just said, no, because you, at that age, um, obviously I said six years ago, I'd have been 25, you know what I mean? You're, you're young, you're like, obviously it's a huge incident in the Premier League history, and then somebody's going to go, oh, David, how was the game? And then you said, well, let's just get on to this. And I'd have had five, mm -hmm. six, seven, eight questions like about, about the incident. Um, so he just said, no press. And then he hammered me for our performance and my performance in the game. Which business as usual, pretty, then. Yeah, business <laughs> as usual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, David, Good it's stuff. been uh, great chatting to you again this morning. Enjoy the final day of the season. We'll chat to you again soon. See you later, guys.